look at the book of Philippians 2. Um, Philippians 2, especially, um, we're going to read 1 through 4 today. But 1 through 12 is called, in, in theological terms, the great kenosis of God, this idea of God manifesting God's self in, in Jesus. But, but this scripture speaks on today in a different kind of way. So Philippians 2, 1 through 4, I'm reading from the Message Bible, and I love this translation of this passage. It says this, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you today and we honor you today, oh God, for this moment and this opportunity, oh God. We are eternally grateful that you continue to shower us with your love, provide us with your presence and and overwhelm us with your grace. Now, O oh God, as we continue to move forward in who you've called us to be, remind us, O oh God, to do it and to make sure while we do it, we're living, loving, and serving. God, every day we wake up is a miracle to celebrate. And we celebrate the miracle of this day, the gift of this day. The truth is, oh God, this is a day we've never seen, and the next minute that's on the way is one we've never seen before. So with every moment that you give us, we will make sure we will fill it, fill it, oh God, with our worship, our honor, our gratitude, our joy. And most of all, oh God, to be reminded that every minute, every moment is filled with divine possibilities. We thank you, God. Now, God, have your way today. Have your way in this place, and it is our prayer that the words that you declare on today, the collective meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer, and we say thank you. Thank you, God. This is our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. Allow me to read that again. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in community in a community of the spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push away. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. I want to add a verse to that to really solidify it because Paul is asking us to take who we are in Jesus seriously. And this verse 5 really sums it. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself he had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what, not at all. In some translations, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Come put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise on today as you take your seat. I am always, at times, suffering some level of conflict with some of the language that we use in church. And it's not that it's bad language, but sometimes because of the attachments to certain words, they can cause conflict. Like, for example, this idea of using the word Christ versus using the word Jesus. Christ it was not his name, and I've said this before. It was a title, 
which is synonymous with Savior, Messiah in some ways. He was Jesus, the Christ. And yet in so many of our institutions, we don't say Jesus, we rather use Christ. Which may say something about the fixation of our institutions that we love to refer to people with titles. Yeah. Versus looking at who people really are. I grew up in a household with some old saint church folk. And I don't think growing up I ever heard the word Christ used the way I heard it used when I went to other spaces and places. For my grandmother, for my mother, and for those who had challenges and trouble, and they would say things like, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. For them and so many other people, Jesus was a friend, a a comforter, a companion. It spoke to really an identifying of Jesus in connection with those of us who've experienced sorrow, suffering, strife, and struggle. It doesn't mean that if you've never experienced that, you can't be connected to Jesus, but it does say something about who we claim to worship. The one we honor, the one whose teachings we follow, and I say it time and time again, but it's worth reminding us, was a poor Palestinian Jewish carpenter. I know there are people who love to make him more than that, who want to make Jesus synonymous with materialism or who want to make Jesus synonymous with consumerism or worse, who want to make Jesus and the church synonymous with intolerance and hate. But the truth of the matter is, when you look closely at the carpenter, it is hard to find a meeting space for those who want to live and wallow in mean-spiritedness, hatred, bitterness, animosity, and intolerance. When you claim to follow Jesus, it ought to shift the center and the circumference of your life. It ought to be the thing that causes you to look differently, not just at yourself, but everyone you encounter. You must be able to put on, as my uh, uh, advisor, mentor, Dr. Sam Proctor would say, that you ought to put on your Jesus lenses every day. You ought to learn to look at the world filtered through the lens, the eyes of Jesus, how Jesus sees people. And when you read the gospel stories, you do not see a person who is overtaken by titles, who is consumed with the rules and rituals of his day. But you see someone who not only comes as an expression of God, but then seeks to reveal the possibilities that we are all in some way expressions of God. And the word that keeps on coming up when the carpenter speaks and the underlying ethos when the carpenter teaches is that powerful and profound word, love, love. Love, when Jesus is pressed on what is the greatest commandment of all, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, that. And then here it is, love your neighbors as yourself. Jesus says, these, this one, upon all the teachings of the law, the prophets hinge on that idea, love your neighbor as yourself. So that means then that for Jesus, there has to be an undercurrent of love in all that we do. There has to be an undercurrent of love in all that we say. It has to be who we claim to be. So when you claim to be a Christian, that's cool, but make sure your Christianity, and this is going to sound strange what I'm about to say, but make sure your Christianity is connected to the carpenter. I say that because I don't want your Christianity to be solely connected to doctrine and dogma and ideas that are filled with intolerance, that spew hatred, that are rife with mean-spirited, and that causes us to become hyper-judgmental and hypercritical of every other person we encounter, and we do it in the name of Jesus. No, if you're going to follow the carpenter, you tear down walls. You break down barriers that have been built on hate and love. You don't find yourself bound to the ideas that keep people apart. You find yourself bound to the ideas that keep people connected, that honors the inherent diversity of all human beings, that honors the inherent dignity of all human beings. Because when you can do that, you do not get concerned with anything but the humanity that you see when you experience and encounter someone else because you see a reflection of yourself that your humanity is reflected in their humanity and their humanity is reflected in your humanity.
That's what I believe personally. Now, that may not be the way everybody believes, but this is how I believe through my understanding of the teachings of Jesus. That's why it is baffling to me to see um, certain believers who use Christianity as a rule and ritual to destroy people. Uh, it is always baffling to me how people use Christianity in ways that undermine the teachings of the carpenter. We then, there are some people who use Christianity as really a issue that only focuses on two things, um, abortion or gay rights. And, and the church, then those who use Christianity in this kind of problematic, hate-filled way, believes that that's all that God has to say, that God doesn't like this and God doesn't like that. That they're so consumed with telling you what God does not like, they never tell you who God loves. And the truth is that if you are a child of God, created by God, you are overtaken, overshadowed by the love of God. But what are some of the things that are markers for those of us who claim to follow the carpenter? Now, I'm not going to give them all to you this morning. I'm really just going to give you one. It is a powerful one. And we find it in all of all places, the teachings of Paul. Now, those of us who've been here long enough know how Paul has often been co-opted and is co-opted for, um, for the means of, 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 of sanctioning oppression. It is the writings of Paul that are often used to sanction the oppression of people that people use. Now, I, I want to drop something in your spirit. Don't take this. Don't steal it because I'm writing it right now. If you try to steal it, we're going to fight because uh, it's the book I'm working on. And, and, but I want to tell you this, and, and I want to drop this in your spirit. We ain't really going to fight, but we might. There's always a possibility. <laughs> But, but, but I've shared this, and I'm going to share it publicly because I, I believe that this thinking is going to shift how we view Christianity. And it is this. The reason why Paul is often co-opted by oppressive structures, and those oppressive structures don't co-opt the teachings of Jesus, is because of the point of departure of the two individuals, Jesus and Paul. You see, Paul says things like this that, that many um, right-leaning Christians say even today. Paul says this, all government is ordained by God. That is what lends some Christians today to say that the person who occupies the White House, that position and his being in the position is ordained by God. They believe that, and they use the scripture to justify that. Now, I want to drop something in spirit. Paul is a Pharisee. Paul is a Jew. But there's something that Paul also is that doesn't get talked about a lot. Paul is a Roman citizen. In other words, it was one time when they were going to beat Paul for his teaching and preaching, but Paul had to remind them, hold on, you can't really touch me. I'm a Roman citizen. In other words, the reason why Paul was able to travel in so many places and move throughout the land was because he was a Roman citizen. Jesus could not move so freely because he was an oppressed Jew who was relegated to certain regions and territories that the Jewish people occupied. Jesus could not go teach in Thessalonica or Galatia or Corinth. He was not a Roman citizen. He could not move that freely. Now, there's some people who have a problem understanding this inability to move freely. We'll just think about like slavery and, and during the black codes that were instituted in this country where black folk had to prove they, they were the property of this person during slavery to be able to move freely and present their papers or during the black code you had to justify why you were out after dark in some cities in this country or go venture across to South Africa where you had to have traveling papers to justify your movements around. You could not move freely when you were oppressed. Jesus could not move freely but Paul could because he was also a Roman citizen. Now as a citizen that meant that he was under the protection of Roman law. Y'all missing this. He was protected. That's why you get his teachings sound a little different because his teachings are the teachings of a protected person. Versus Jesus is unprotected. He is a poor, oppressed Jew growing up in Roman-occupied territory. He is not protected like Paul. The language of the unprotected always sounds different versus the language of the protected. This is why there's such a radical difference in the things Paul says sometimes and what Jesus said is because Paul is able to move freely because of his protected status as a Roman citizen. So, so if you are protected by the rules that are in place and you want to maintain your, your protection, you're not going to move counter to the status that maintains your privilege as a citizen. So Paul is going to say things like, slave, be obedient to your master. That's the language of a protected person. 
But Jesus doesn't say anything like that. Jesus is an oppressed person who speaks out of the depth of his oppression and the oppression of his people. And he's seeking to enable his people to gain some affirmation of their humanity connected to their divinity, connected to their God, to bolster their confidence, boost their esteem. So although their bodies might be occupied, their minds will be free. See, that's the real place of liberation. Don't think that liberation is just in your body being free because a whole lot of us right now who are no shackles, no chains, but our minds are so bound that we do the greater work. So the work of the carpenter is about liberating your mind, liberating your thinking, setting loose the constraints that we often grow up with, how we love certain people, hate other people, the constraints that we use, that we grow up with, and we justify those constraints, the hatred, the bitterness, all in the name of God. And we forget about Jesus. So here, Paul says something that's very interesting when you read this first few verses. And can I just give it to you this way? When you look at the last portion of verse 4, Paul says this, and it is powerful. He says, so do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. So there are many, again, markers of what it means to follow the carpenter. I'm going to give you one this morning that I think will be helpful. It's called selflessness. That when you follow the carpenter, selflessness is paramount. Now that may seem antithetical to an age that is intoxicated with selfishness. It's all about ourselves and getting for you and getting ahead and getting people to follow and getting people to like and getting people to retweet your stuff and you being the center, you taking selfies, you taking pictures. It's all about you, 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 me, myself, and I, 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 I. When I have conversations with people and all they can say is I, 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 it turns me off because that means that you're so self-centered, self-intoxicated, self-engrossed, self-aggrandizing that you can't see nobody else in the space. That's not the way of the carpenter. Paul hits you here. Think about other people. Think about lifting up other people. Put yourself to the side. Don't always try to be on top. Don't try to sweet talk your way to the top. Think about other people who may need help along the way. Think about the people who've been damaged, who've been wounded, who've been hurt. Think about the people who you often look over, the overlooked, the undercounted, the ostracized, the marginalized in our culture. Think about those people and all their manifestations and everywhere you go because the undercounted, the overlooked, the ostracized, the marginalized look different from region to region. And what Jesus is saying, what Paul is saying through his understanding of Jesus is that if you're going to put on the mind of Christ, something about you ought to live in a selfless space where everything you do can't be about you. But when you begin to honor who other people are and honor the dignity and show love, what you find out pretty soon is that which you give is that which you get back. This is not rocket science. If you put positive energy in the atmosphere, positive energy will find you. If you put love in the atmosphere, love will find you. If you put kindness and peace and joy in the atmosphere, kindness and peace and joy will find you. You don't have to fight for some stuff that's waiting to fall upon you. All of those things are your reward for being a child of God. And here's the thing, we oftentimes find ourselves fighting for certain things because we're looking for certain things from certain people. I'm gonna say it again. We fight for certain things because we're looking for certain things from certain people. And sometimes when you fight for certain things, looking for certain things from certain people, you miss what you already have that God gave you. No, life is too short. To always just be thinking about you. Now, I know what you're saying. This culture tells you, if I don't look out for me, who won't look out for me? Well, hold on. You just said you're a child of God. If I don't do for me, who won't do for me? We are ever-evolving individuals? No. Community. 
that when community is being built, we begin to look after the needs of those who are in community, love those who are in community, serve those who are in community, live with those who are in community. That's what we are seeking to be. And it's so hard in this world. But, but this is why Paul hit you with this one. Be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. That your mind must be renewed so you see life different and live life different and understand life differently. It's amazing how for so many people this weekend is a day of celebration. For so many people this weekend, this day is a day where people can honor the truth of who they are. And sometimes we could come into a space like FCBC and be lulled to sleep and think this is what it really is all the time. But just as there are people who celebrate today, there are other people who are spewing nothing but vitriolic language and hate and terror. And they're doing it in Jesus' name. That is not the way of the carpenter. I, 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 I had a conversation with Pastor Kendra and some other people the other day. There's some people who look at some people who are, who are gay and tell them, you're going to hell. And many people who are in here who may be gay have heard that. You're going to hell. How many of you heard that before? Tell the truth. You might have said it. Don't lie. Put your hands up. Now, y'all know y'all have heard that. Stop playing. Y'all been halfway holding up your hands. I ain't never heard that. Stop lying. <laughs> I asked that question. I thought something. <laughs> if you grew up in church, you heard that. Now let's try this again, cause y'all playing games. How many people heard that if you, if a gay people are going to hell? Tell the truth. Going to hell. Okay. Okay. Let's use that theory. Let's work with that. I'm gonna end this sermon today, and we're gonna celebrate. Let's go with that theory. If you're gay, you're going to hell, as well as some other sins we like to throw people in hell for. If you're gay, you're going to hell. If you, any sin, but tell the truth, in our day, for many Christians, it ain't any sin that send you to hell. It's certain sins, because we're very selective in our hierarchy of sin. We have a hierarchy that we're very selective. Some sin forgivable, other sin hell bound. Some sin we love, and other sin we just, you know, it's amazing how the sins we excuse are usually the ones we practice the most. <laughs> Ain't that so? But let me get this. Here's my new theory. Here's my new theory. I shared with Pastor Kendra one day and some other people, and because everybody wants to put somebody in hell. I understand it. Now, here it is. Here it is. Here's the deal. Here's the teaching. And everybody's going to love this. Don't try to use it when you leave here today because you ain't really worked on it as long as I did. All right? Tell them to watch the, the, on the, on the uh, stream service. Watch it, right? And here it is. Here it is. In most traditional teaching, we say, Christian teaching that many of us grew up in, we say God is omnipotent, which means God is all-powerful, right? God is omniscient, which means God is all-knowing. Would you agree we hear that? How about this one? God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere. Freeze for a second. God is everywhere because if there's some place that God cannot be, then God is not omnipresent. So hold on for a second. There are people that some folk trying to put in hell, and yet God is everywhere. David said in the Psalms, whether can I go from your presence? He said, if I descend to the depths of hell, he says this, thou art there. In it deep, there's some folk who try to put you in hell, don't even know they're sending you closer to God. In that deep, if God is everywhere, where can I go out of God's presence? And if God is everywhere, guess what comes with God? God's love, God's forgiveness, God's healing, God's joy, God's peace, God's grace, God's mercy. Everywhere you go. And so instead of trying to send somebody to hell, focus on how you're serving the carpenter. And how you're seeking to live and love and serve. And honor who God has called you to be. You must have a sad, boring life when you spend all your days talking about somebody else. Uh-uh. God has given you more of enough of an assignment just to live the way you ought to live and love the 
the way you ought to love and serve the way you ought to serve, that you don't have time to be preoccupied with who doing this and who doing this. Can I hit you with this one? Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. Don't talk about the speck in your brother's eye. You got a beam coming out of your eye. That's what the carpenter says. And that's who we're called to be. And anything else that doesn't begin with love is counterfeit Christianity. If it don't start with love, end with love, live through love, it ain't in the way of the carpenter. And a whole lot of people talking about it, but they ain't being about it. That's what we have to do in this season. I know this ain't popular with everybody, you know. And some folk will tell me, oh, he a heretic, you know that. God bless you. Go to McBurg King and get your whopper the way you want it. But as long as the Lord keeps me here, yes, we will always be an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers who have been called by God to live the lives we are created to live, love beyond the limits of our prejudices, and commissioned by God to serve. That is who we are. That is who God has called us to be. And if God is happy, it don't matter what nobody else thinks. Stand on your feet. Doors of the church open today. Don't ever let somebody fool you to think that somehow they honoring Jesus by being divisive and mean-spirited. It's like one of the candidates said in the debates. If you use religious language or make a claim to Christianity, and you find seeing children at the border separated from parents, Stop talking about you a Christian. If you claim to be someone who follows a carpenter and you're okay with seeing children hungry and people have no place to sleep, don't claim to follow the carpenter. But if you are in that position, know this, you have a friend in Jesus. It was the carpenter who said this, foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It was the carpenter who said, In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have already overcome the world. Those are the words of the carpenter. It ain't always easy living this life the power that's available through God and through who God has made you to be is real. If there's another lesson you get out of this today, don't be selfless or selfish. Be selfless. Before you speak some words, think about the person on the other end of your words. Before you do some things, think about the people who are on the other end of your actions. Don't just live your life speaking or thinking for yourself and sucking up all the air in every room you enter. There are people in this world whose lives can be transformed by the power of your words and your touch and your presence. Don't rob them of that because you're busy being bitter. Don't, don't, don't rob them of seeing the best of God by seeing the best of you. You're better that today this year is about being human being human honoring your own humanity by honoring the humanity of someone else and it's not always one dimensional we treat people different who we believe are of different class or who poor or who homeless we label people we think everybody homeless is a criminal or has some mental illness. Not knowing that people, families are working two and three jobs and still struggling. By the way, look, you know it or not, this is New York City. Where you have many people paying more than 40% of income on rent. 
If you pay more than 40% of your income on rent, you can't survive. So before you start judging somebody, as Paul says, help somebody. Before you begin to chastise and ridicule, extend yourself. Put yourself to the side and lift somebody else up. Because that's the way of the carpenter. So two things before we go.